Hey, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm also recording this uh, meeting um, just in case um, you'd like to review it again or if there's somebody that was unable to attend this morning. Uh, what we're going to cover today is the classic um, calendar year-end uh, materials. So we're going to start with USAS first, and then we're going to go um, and finish off with payroll. Um, right now, I'm at the classic calendar year-end meeting page. <clears throat> so I um, included this link on the chat, and I also included it in um, the uh, Fridays with Fiscal, there's a link there for today's session that will take you to the same spot. So next week, we're going to have the same type of thing, same type of page for the redesigned calendar year-end review. So it'll look very similar. Um, we have the agenda up at the top. <clears throat> so um, it just shows you know, what's going to be covered today. Um, and there are some changes on the payroll side that Andrew is going to cover, so that's all been noted on the agenda. Once this uh, webinar is complete, um, I'm going to upload it into the YouTube channel, and it's going to be available here also as well. Uh, we'll have a link for the recorded webinar. And so on the left-hand side, you're going to see the USAS-related materials, and then on the payroll um, side, you're going to see all the payroll-related materials. Um, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to go quick just to the closing procedure. Um, this is our checklist, and basically the presentation reviews the steps on the checklist and just has a couple extra screens, um, screenshots, things like that. Um, so um, we won't actually be going through this actual checklist here. We'll be covering it in the presentation. But just to show you what it looks like, I'm going to go ahead and just click on it. And so these are generic procedures. Now, all of um, you guys, all these ITCs, you guys have your own procedures. You've tweaked them, customized them, threw in your own uh, maybe report runs and things like that, um, and how you do closings um, differently. Um, but this is just, just basically showing you what is some of the things that are required and what's recommended. And so this is what we're going to cover here in the PowerPoint presentation. So with USAS, not a whole lot with calendar year end. You're basically closing the month of December, and then you're going in and running your 1099 information, um, making a backup of the calendar year end or generating calendar year reports, any copy, if you do some type of cal copy at calendar year end and then running adjust again for to close for the entire year. Okay, so I'm going to go back. I am getting some feedback, so for those of you on the call, just make sure that you mute your phones. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover the presentation here. I'm going to get started on that. Pull that up. Okay, I think I found that trouble spot there, so. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start this presentation here. <clears throat> okay, assuming everybody can see my screen okay here. And so um, the first thing I'm gonna discuss is, what, or basically the overview. We're gonna talk about calendar year on closing. Um, the submission dates are the same as they were last year at the end of January. Um, and then we're going to go through the TR 1099 program as well. Okay, so these are just some reminder things that can be done um, before you start closing for the year, and that's um, the vendor TIN number. Um, so basically, move this over a little bit here. Okay. And so the TIN type is located in VEN screen. So this is going to determine whether the taxpayer ID number is an SSN or an EIN. So a couple of years ago, it's been about two, maybe three years now, we had to add that field and, um, and then everyone had to go in and update the field. Um, so now most of these, you know, have been updated, so it's not that much of a, of a big deal anymore. But if districts 
have gone in and added vendors, unfortunately, in USAS Web, the EIN and the SSN aren't in there. So they were never added in USAS Web. So they need to be added, this type needs to be added in VenScreen. So we just recommend that districts that added new vendors this year to go out there, they can run, and they know that they're 1099 vendors, they could run like the F1099 report now if they wanted to, and they would get an error on vendors that are missing the SSN or EIN, this vendor TIN type. So um, they could run that and then go in to VenScreen and add those vendors, or I'm sorry, add those SSN or EIN type to it. Um, so that's one way of checking it and making sure that you have those labeled. If not, you know, when they get to the point where they're actually running their F1099, they're going to get the warning then to say there's not a um, SSN or EIN associated with this vendor. All they would have to do is go into event screen, go down to that particular field, enter in an S or an E, save it, and rerun the 1099 program. Um, other things that can be verified um, for 1099 vendors, um, you can run the VEN SSN. Unfortunately, the VEN SSN doesn't include that vendor uh, TIN type, the SSN or the EIN flag, so that's not going to help you in that particular part, but it does allow the uh, user just to look at their 1099 vendors and make sure address information is correct, the year-to-date totals are correct, those amounts. Um, so there are a couple different options they can run in Vent SSN to get that information. And so we've got arrows next to a couple of those. Um, the option four is going to pull any vendor that's marked as a 1099 vendor with a year-to-date activity meeting the IRS requirement, which is $600 or more. So it's just going to pull those in to the report so that the end user can look over the data. Um, option six is going to pull in all 1099 vendors regardless of the amount. So if they wanted to run a report to see all their 1099 vendors, review it, look at the amounts, um, and realize that there's somebody there that needs to get a 1099 and they need to make a change to the amount or something like that. Um, then um, they can go in, obviously, and make changes to the vendor. So those are two different ways. Um, another more, um, oh, <clears throat> this is something they don't have to do, but um, they can go in, and if they want to look at all their vendors that have year-to-date amount of $600 or more that is not listed as a 1099, they can run a report using option five. And it will go out there and find all those vendors. And obviously, I'm not sure how many that would be, but it may be quite a few. Um, but they could see if there is potentially one that isn't marked as a 1099 that should be. They would find that then on this report. So those are the three different ways to run that, 10, that then SSN, either option four, six, or, or five. So. Um, and then the report basically looks like this. So it has, um, it's pretty straightforward. It's got the vendor information, the vendor name, um, the city state zip, the um, SSN or EIN, and the calendar year to date amount on there. So that is what's listed on there. So if their vendor is using a different name for 1099 reporting, <clears throat> they can enter that reportable name on the second name field of the vendor record. Um, so if the name of the <clears throat> um, business is um, Cupcake Bakery, um, and but really the 1099 should be going to Sue Jones, you could put Sue Jones in on that second name field. Um, when you do that, though, in order for the F-1099 program to pick it up, you have to put the 1099 colon in front of that. So and I have an example of that. So what happens then 
is when the F1099 program runs, it's going to strip off the 1099 colon and just use the name that's following that as the primary name on the 1099 reporting form. So let me show you what that looks like here. Here's an example. So here, the name of the business is ABC Consulting, but the 1099 should go to Fran Smith. So on the vendor record, it's set up like this. So we've got the 1099 colon right there on the second name field with Fran's name behind it. And so what happens then is um, obviously on the purchase order, it looks like this. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If they want to leave this out there all year so they don't forget about it um, when they're running their 1099s at the end of the year, it's going to show like this on the actual purchase order uh, with ABC Consulting, 1099, Colin Fran Smith. If they don't want that to show on their POs, they can <clears throat> um, remove this and then just add it before they're running their 1099s. Um, but when this is in here on the second name field, the bottom picture here is showing you what it's going to look like on the 1099. It's going to find that 1099 colon, strip that off, ignore the ABC Consulting, and just put Fran Smith on the 1099 form. <clears throat> and obviously this is something that they can test out, you know, when they're, you know, going here, entering information in, if they're unsure of what it's going to look like, run the F1099 program and see what it looks like, and they'll know then what's going to get pulled onto um, that 1099. Um, they can run the F1099 program as many times as they want. There's an option in there where it asks you if you want to create the tape file, um, but other than that, you know, the text file, the report, they can run that as many times as they want. And, and take a look at that and make sure that everything looks good. It'll tell them, again, if there are errors because of the SSN or EIN type missing, and also it's going to give them basically what, you know, what it's going to look like on their actual 1099 run. So it's not a bad idea to run that ahead of time. So other information here, um, just on the vendor um, that deals with um, calendar year end reporting, obviously, we've got the name and the second name field. We've got our 1099 information in here, so the 1099 type and the ID, whether it's um, an EIN or an SSN. Like I said before, this is a USAS web screenshot. So we don't see that EIN SSN type in here. That has to be put in then screen. So it's not in here. And then the other things that have to do with year-to-date reporting, our calendar amount is over here. That is modifiable. So if for some reason, you know, this is, Jones Consulting is a 1099 vendor, but we only want to report $1,000 and not the $2,000, um, the user can go in and modify the screen and change that amount. And then when the 1099 program runs, it's going to pull whatever is in this calendar year to date amount field. Any questions about setting up the vendors for 1099 reporting? Okay, we'll go ahead and we will move on with um, the December month and closing. And this is just, um, nothing's changed here, so I'm just going to review. I know we have some newer people um, at the ITC, so I'm just going to go through and explain um, the month in closing a little more detail. Um, so in here, when they close out for the month of December, then you want to make sure that all of their transactions are entered for the current month. And they do want to perform their bank reconciliation procedure. Now I'm sure all your districts have a spreadsheet or some way that they uh, reconcile with the bank every month. Um, we do have a procedure out there in the USAS user guide <clears throat> under useful, uh, USAS useful procedures that go through the bank reconciliation. Um, they want to exact, examine um, the reports and make sure that they're in balance. Um, the USA EMS EDT, uh, there's a cash rec option in there. So there's actually uh, four different options in the USA EMS EDT. The other three have to do with fiscal year end. 
Um, cash rec is something if they want to do the, run the cash rec every month, they're not required to except for June. Um, but I know a lot of them are reconciling with the spreadsheet. But it's a good idea for them to go in and just enter in that same information into um, the cash rec program too because what it does at the end of the program, um, it goes out there and makes sure whatever amounts that you've entered in cash rec balances with the cash balance on the system. So, and, and they would get a warning message if they were out of balance. Um, another thing that they can do is go out there and check that their encumbrances are in check. They can run a PO detail report of just outstanding purchase orders. And then on the bout check, um, I'm just going to jump down a couple lines here. There is an outstanding encumbered amount on there as well. There's a line um, for their outstanding encumbrances. That should match the outstanding encumbrances on the PO detail. So the outstanding encumbered line on the bout check should coincide with the amount on the PO detail. If they don't match, we do have a program called uh, Fix Encumbrance that will recalculate um, the encumbered amount. If that still doesn't um, match, then they obviously would be calling you guys um, to ask why. And then if there's some, if you guys aren't um, quite sure um, what the problem is, you can always create a classic ticket to us. Um, some other things on the bow check. And so there, um, we also have these are kind of like periods in time. So we've got fiscal to date, month to date, year to date, project to date amounts on the bow check for each type of account. Um, cash, um, budget, appropriation, revenue, to make sure that all of those are in agreement. That's what the bell check report does. So it's just a good idea for them just to run this at the month, just to make sure that everything is in agreement. Um, if there is a problem, uh, at the end of each line on the bell check, there is an error message that is displayed. And obviously, if that error message is on there, they should not ignore it. Um, you know, they would want to call you guys and see what's going on. Um, sometimes you get error messages on transfers or things like that. There's an area on the second page of the bell check that has the amount balances for transfers and advances. Um, so they just want to make sure that their bell check is clean, that all the amounts match on every line and there isn't an error at the end of each line, and they want to make sure, too, that the um, current encumbered amounts, the outstanding amounts, match the amounts on the PO detail. So if all of that looks good, you can move on and run a FinSum. So this is your cash report in USAS, and they're going to select yes to generate the FIN debt at the same time. So they run, at this, uh, they run simultaneously. And what happens then, at the end of the report run, it's going to display the ending cash balances for both the fin debt and the fin sum. Those must agree. If those are not, if those do not match, you get a little um, error message or a little warning saying your amounts do not balance. They should not proceed until those get resolved. So it's rare that we get those type of questions anymore. Um, with Classic, I haven't seen many tickets come through about fin debt and, and fin sum not balancing. Um, but if it does happen, those should not be um, ignored. Um, so once they run a fin sum and their fin debt is in line with the fin sum, balances look good to them, um, the next thing they can do, this is optional, is they can run the SM2 calc. Now the SM2 calc is from the SM12 program. So when you go into SM12, you have several options in there. And one of them, the first option is running the SM2. What that's going to do basically is calculate the accounts that are involved in the SM2, and it's going to populate those amounts uh, for the month for those um, accounts. And so you'll be able to see those then underneath the SM2 main program. You can run reports. Um, that's all part of the SM12 program. Um, so they can go in and run this SM2 calc beforehand. It'll generate an SM2 report. And from there then they can view that. I know a lot of districts um, 
give this report to their board, so they may be running this ahead of time to make sure that everything looks good. Um, these same figures are their forecast figures as well, pretty much. Um, so that's another reason why they may be running the SM2 report. If they don't run SM2 calc ahead of time, that's okay because adjust, when adjust is run for the month, it runs SM2 calc automatically. So if they did not run SM2 calc beforehand, they close for the month and they're like, oh, I need that report, it's okay because those amounts got populated when they ran adjust. They can just go back into the SM2, SM12 program and go down to the SM2M report and run the report for the prior month. So it is, it is, it is out there, those do get tracked, but again, if they want to see those figures ahead of time, they can run it now before they close. So the next step is running monthly CD. Um, and so this is going to generate their December reports. And they just want to make sure that monthly CD runs too. You know, after they run monthly CD, if they, if you guys have it set up um, that it runs in batch mode and that it gets done at night, um, that's great. But they just need to make sure that they go in and take a look at it and make sure that that December line's been created. The monthly CD Okay, I think we're okay now. Okay. So the next thing is um, uh, recommended um, reports that need to be done at the end of the month. Now, monthly CD takes care of a lot of these. Um, but if the district wants to run some reports before they run adjust for the month, um, these are just some recommended reports that we have. And then they can also generate any additional calendar year end reports if desired. So if there are like a bud sum that they want to run, hold on a minute here. Okay, I think we're good. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I think, um, Heidi, I'm not sure if that's yours. I think it might be your, see that you're coming in here. I think it Madeline, might be yours. Heidi. Hey, Heidi, it's Monica. You're on speaker. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. FTP down, we can see the meta side of things. Okay, hang on, let me look. Hold on a minute. File transfer, can you get? There we go, sorry about that, you guys. I had to uh, turn off my PowerPoint here for a little bit to get that going. Sorry for the interruption. Back to the month in closing. Okay, so, um, Creating a copy of the calendar year end files, you guys have the option of creating a copy. So if you want a backup copy of the calendar year end data, um, you guys I'm sure all have a procedure um, to, to back up those calendar year end files. Um, so if you don't have a procedure or you're wanting to know how is that done, you know, you can create a ticket to us and we can help you with that. But I believe all of you have a procedure already in place for your ITC. Uh, the next thing um, is then hire. Um, there is a VH reset option in then hire that allows them um, to reset any vendors that are flagged out there as reported back to a reportable status. So that's for those districts that are running then hire. <laughs> so I'm not sure how many are actually actively running then hire. They may be submitting. Um, that data to um, the new hire reporting center on their website. Um, but if they use the then hire report to create a report to submit to the new hire reporting center, that's fine. Um, but if when they do um, and they go in and run the then hire report every month or every few months, what happens is once a vendor meets that $2,500 threshold, for the year, 
it sets that flag to report it for the year. So um, it won't get reported again to the new hire reporting center. So now if they want to, if this is a vendor they're going to be using the next year, they want to reset that flag back to reportable for the new year, at the end of the calendar year, they can run this BH reset option and it will go out there then and reset those. So this is what the screen looks like basically. It generates a report of those vendors that are going to be reset and that's about it. And it just goes out there then to the vendor record of those specific vendors and sets that flag back to reportable status so they're ready to go for, fiscal, for calendar year 20. And so the next step is to close. So we went through balancing, we went through running reports that are recommended, um, we went through monthly CD, making sure that runs, a backup of their files, um, and now the next thing that needs to be done is running adjust. So uh, when they run adjust, obviously they shouldn't be in any other programs at the time, um, and then they're going to select month end. So <clears throat> before they run adjust again for calendar, they need to be running um, the F1099 program. So with F1099, I, we kind of have a screenshot of the end of the program of all the different options that are entered in the F1099 program. But you're going to see how it's going to basically review your district information. So the school districts, they want to just verify that all of the district information is correct. Um, it's going to ask um, the, your reporting re requirements and the defaults are $610 for royalty. And then do you want to report vendors with no ID number? Do you want to utilize check name and address so they can mark that yes or no to what they want? Um, another prompt in the program is, do you want to create the tape file? Um, so if they, you know, if they ran the 1099, done a couple test runs of F1099, they're probably going to make sure that that says no at that time. It doesn't hurt anything, it's just going to create a tape file, but I would probably be in the habit of saying no until you are actually ready to run your actual 1099 file. Um, so like I said, they do a couple test runs of the F-1099 and the F-1099 report looks good. There's no missing EIN or SSN numbers. All the amounts look good. The, you know, 1099 name looks good. Um, then they would go in, run 10, F-1099 again, saying yes to create a tape file and the payment year. Very important that they put 2019 in there. Payer name control is really not used a whole lot. You guys might... Um, it depends if your ITC um, has that information in there, you can. Um, otherwise, um, it, it's not required, so you can just skip over that step. And then what happens then at the end um, is that the 1099 produces four output files. So the F1099.txt file, like I said, that's the report, and it's going to sort it by the income types. Um, and that's where you can see if there's any problems, errors, or anything, anything's missing. Uh, the DAT file, this contains the 1099 data that's used with your laser-generated forms. Um, so that's the file you're going to be using to upload into if you have the EDGE program for 1099 printing. It's what you're going to be using. Um, the form file. I don't believe any of the ITCs are using pin-fed forms for 1099s. I believe everyone's on the laser one, so you can basically skip that one. And then the tape file. So this is the file that contains the 1099 information in the format needed for the IRS. So what you're going to do at the end of this is you're going to have, if you have 20 districts, you're going to have 20 different tape files, one for every district and then you guys are going to be appending those and making one file um, that's going to be sent to the IRS via the TR-1099 program. We'll talk about that, here, that in a little bit. So look over that F-1099 report carefully. That's what they need to look over to make sure the district should be looking at that to make sure there's no, any, no errors. And um, if everything looks good, they're basically going to notify you guys somehow 
um, telling you that the 1099s are ready um, to be printed. I'm assuming most of you do the printing for your districts and that the data is ready to be submitted to the IRS. So once they go through that 1099 procedure, and we'll talk further about that here in a little bit, um, then they're ready to close for the year and they're gonna run adjust again from the normal account. And this time, they're gonna, they aren't gonna do the month end, they're gonna select the year end. And then within year end, there's either calendar or fiscal. So obviously they're gonna select the calendar option. Again, everyone should be out when they're doing this. And it will um, close, them, close them for calendar year 19. So all of their calendar year to date amounts um, on the accounts, their vendor year-to-date amounts, those will all get wiped out um, and set to zero to begin the next calendar year. So once they're finished with this, they can proceed with processing and USAS for January. Any questions about those month-end procedures or calendar year-end? Okay, I know it's basically review for um, most of you. Um, the 1099 submission to the IRS, like I said, this hasn't changed from last year. They're due by the 31st. So I think we've all gotten pretty good about getting things out um, and submitted to the IRS before the 31st. So, I've, and I'm also assuming that most of you submit electronically and you're going to do that on the IRS's FIRE system. So um, we recommend that you guys create your own deadline with your districts to notify, to let them get you their 1099 data ahead of that January 31st deadline so that you guys have time to collect all of their tape files, append them, run them through the TR 1099 program, and submit them by the 31st. So, you know, getting those tape files from your districts um, you know, a few days ahead, if not a week ahead, would be a good idea. So it doesn't, it doesn't give you, it gives you guys plenty of time to getting that out to them and, and or submitting it to the IRS. So um, these next slides just talk about some general 1099 procedures that are done after um, the 1099 program is run. So you guys probably, you know, obviously all of you have your own procedures with your uh, districts, but this is just more of general of what should be done after the F1099 program is run. So again, you know, they're probably, you're probably ensuring that the tape file is created so that they ran that F1099, making sure that they generated the tape file. So you're probably looking at those output files um, and making sure that everything's there. Um, you can rename those output files to a different extension in order to save them for later use or to archive them. So you may want to take those output files and make a copy of them with an underscore 19 or something like that and save those out there so you have a copy of their 1099 run at the end of each calendar year. Um, like I said before, the DAT file can be used with the EDGE software to generate the 1099 forms. And then those can be printed on self-sealing 1099 laser forms. I'm sure you guys all have, you know, the forms, I think the form order went out a couple months ago already for the self-sealing forms. And then I'm assuming you all have like a sealer there that you run those forms through and then give them to your district. So if, you know, so like I said, if you are printing those for your districts, um, this is just a recommendation. You guys, you know, you guys may do something a little bit different, but um, you can provide them obviously a copy of the actual self seal. They'll need that. And also a vendor copy um, just to show them or I'm sorry, a district copy, so that the district has a copy of the 1099s. Um, you can provide the F1099 report to them, or they may save that on their own of what was generated for the year, and also instructions on how to distribute the 1099s. Okay, 
The next thing we're going to talk about is the TR-1099 program. So what happens is after, um, you got, after they run their 1099s for the year, all of your districts, um, and if you guys are doing the reporting on their behalf, um, you have to get those to the IRS by January 31st. Um, and I believe all of you use, um, submit those electronically through the IRS FIRE website. Um, so one thing that I did find differently, I looked through the IRS um, changes for calendar year 19. And the only thing I found different this year, and I don't really think this pertains to anybody here because I think everyone um, has a 44, Form 4419 already when you guys originally requested a TCC number, which you guys all probably did when you first started on the fire system years ago. Um, but what this is basically saying is they just made a change and said for those that need uh, TCC number, you used to fill out a form and send it to them. Now that form must be um, filed electronically. So that's the only change that I really saw. Like I said, I know all of you already have a TCC number that you've been using every year, so you don't have to worry about this. But I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention just to let them know that that is the only change I really saw with 1099s for the year. Um, the Form 1096 transmittal form is not required when you're doing electronic submissions, so you don't need about to worry about the 1096 form. Um, so those are just that's just one the only change I really saw for the year. If you've never submitted a test file, so this um, slide's talking about test files. Um, it is required for your very first submission under the combined federal state reporting program. So I believe every district has, or every ITC has done a test file. It's been out there um, for quite some time now. Um, it's not required to do a test file every year um, after you've done your first initial one, but we do recommend um, to do it just to make sure that everything's working okay. So, you know, you can just pull up, um, it has here, um, the instructions that are needed in order to perform a text file. So you may include one or more of your district's 1099 files. Um, there has to be at least 11 vendors per district. So you can't have less than that. Um, and then obviously in the TR-1099 program, there's a test option. And you have to select that. And then you're gonna submit that test file to a different fire system. It's called fire.test.irs.gov. So that's where the test submittals go. So if you've never done one before, you are required to, but if you've already done a test file in a prior year, you don't have to, but it's recommended. So that's totally up to the ITC and what you wanna do, but um, it is an option out there that you can do. Just peace of mind, I guess, just to make sure that things are working okay. It's recommended to do this submission sometime in November um, or early December. And um, when you actually do the actual submit submission, you will receive an approval letter from the IRS. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, on the test submission, you'll receive an approval letter, and this uh, must be approved before actually submitting them. Here is um, some, I found this on the IRS website about um, the test system availability and the actual fire system availability. So underneath, since we're talking about the test one here, um, down here it shows you when it's available. So it looks like it's available from November 4th through December 6th. So you can do your test submission anytime between those dates. Um, it looks like the fire system availability um, is, it looks like, I'm not sure what the controlled launch means, but available, it looks like January 10th, and it's available 24 hours a day until the end of the year update. So 
I'm assuming that's from the 10th through the 31st. So once you're done with your test submission, obviously, um, you know, you're doing this now, basically, and then your districts won't be running the F-1099 program until, you know, January. Um, and at that time then, once you're done with all of that, or they're done with all of that, you get all the tape files, then you're going to run the TR-1099, and which we'll get to here in a little bit, and you're going to basically go in then and um, run the actual option instead of the test option, and you're going to submit it um, underneath the actual fire system, not the test one. The so one change that I wanted to mention regarding a pending file. So like I said, you get all those uh, F-1099 DAP files from, or tape files from your district. You need to append them all. Well, we had an issue last year with the redesign uh, tape files uh, regarding an invalid record size, and you guys had to do this convert, append, truncate type of um, prompt in the VMS side in order for those redesigned files to get appended with the classic files. They are fixing that. So you should not have to worry about that. In fact, I was told it's going out in the next release. They're going to be in the process here of testing it. So it's not out in this next one. Our, our release cycles run in every two weeks. So if it's not out on the next one, it'll be on the one after that. Um, so you won't have to do that convert a pen truncate. You won't have to worry about the invalid record size. You would do your normal append procedure that you've done in the past, whether it's a redesign tape file or it's a classic tape file. So this is just an example of how to run the, that appends. So you're basically pulling those tape files from those different um, disk drives um, that they're stored on. And so you're pulling them all, whether they're classic or redesigned tape files, and then a space, and then the name of that append file that contains all of the tape file data in it. So in our example, we're calling it F1099.dat, I believe is what it is. Um, and so that's one way, um, or the only way that I know of, to append that file. Um, I do have a question here about um, the test file. Is that if the ITC has never done one or if a new person at the ITC has never done one? If the ITC has never done one, not a specific staff member, if the ITC has never done one. So running the uh, TR-1099 program, um, these are the options. So basically, it's going to ask for that appended file that you just created. And then it's going to ask you for an output file name. You can give it whatever name you want. Um, our example here is irstax.dat. It's going to ask for the transmitter's taxpayer ID number, the transmitter's name, company name, contact person. That's all the ITC information. Um, type of file, obviously, when you were doing the test, you would select the test option. When you're doing the actual submission, after you've got everybody's tape files and you've pended them, you're going to use the original option. The transmitter code, that's that TCC code I was talking about earlier. So that's something you guys all have because you've already taken care of that years ago. So you're going to use that same TCC code you've been using before. And then are you approved for the combined federal state filing? Um, assuming all ITCs did that years ago as well. So you say yes to that. Obviously, prior year, um, you're going to say no to that. This isn't anything to do with prior year data. Um, so you're going to bypass that option. And then what happens then is it's going to give you an output file, the TR1099.txt. So you're going to have that output file, which is just a report and it's a really good thing to, to take a look at to make sure that all of your classic and redesigned districts were included. And you can double check in there. It shows the counts. Um, 
So if you've got, you know, Sampleville District that had 12 um, 1099s, you want to make sure that all 12 of those vendors are included. Um, so it will look at, it will show you that, and it will show you the amount as well. So you guys want to verify that too, just to make sure that you've got everybody and you've got all the correct information. Sometimes the district will call you and say, I ran my 1099s, and then two days later they're like, yeah, I forgot a couple. So you just want to make sure that um, when they rerun it, you pull the correct tape file and then that correct information is included on this TO 1099 text file. Obviously, the other output file is um, the one that is going to be created to be submitted to the IRS. So that's that page back up here. In our example, IRS tax.dat file. So you're going to get a TR 1099.txt file and then that output file that's going to be submitted into the fire system. So that DAT file has to be electronically submitted by the 31st. Um, there are instructions out there. There is a publication 1220 that talks about electronic filing. And also in there, um, it, um, you can also, it references the IRS fire system. And when you go into the fire system, you guys probably have this already recorded from what you guys did last year. Um, you got a username, password, all of that. So you're going to use that same information, your TCC number, and you're going to go in and upload that file that you just created in the TR-1099 into the fire system. And what I recommend doing is making sure you keep a copy of any type of correspondence that goes back and forth. When you submit that file, you're going to get um, an email and some information on the screen saying you have submitted it print that, um, keep a hold of that stuff. And um, what you're going to finally get there in the end is you're going to get an email from them saying that, um, that the status is good and that it's been reported. So I would just keep all of those correspondence, print those off and store those somewhere um, so that you have a copy of that your district's uh, 1099 data was successfully submitted to the IRS. Any questions about the TR-1099 program or submitting to the FIRE system? Like I said, you can do a test file. Um, you don't have to, but I believe most ITCs do just to make sure that things are good. Um, and if you want to test it um, after the fix that we're going to do, um, and pull a redesigned district um, into your test file, that might be a good idea to make sure that everything's working good. Um, and then obviously you're going to be doing your original submission to the regular fire system after your districts have completed their 1099. Just a couple of other things um, that have happened since uh, fiscal year end. To classic, not much, um, <laughs> since all of our efforts are on the redesign. Um, but we did have a couple updates. On September 12th, um, an OOPS release was done to include Fund 467. So that was added to the software. Um, and it shows here um, the files that were updated. Um, so I'm assuming you've all um, done that, OOPS, installed that OOPS release. And then on October 8th, um, we had to create a new version of USAS Web because people were having problems creating that Fund 467 in USAS Web. They could do it in, in a USA screen, an account screen just fine, uh, but they were getting an, an issue with the EMIS Fund category. They were getting an error, and it wouldn't let them change the EMIS Fund category, and it wouldn't let them create the fund. So uh, we installed or created a new version of USAS Web that corrected that, and that's an OECN download. So those are the only two things that we have done um, with USAS since the fiscal year end. Okay, any other questions about the classic closing? 
looking at my chat here. I don't see anything else. Uh, this slide here just talks about um, the calendar year-end webinar for the redesign. It will be held next week. Um, and it just shows the registration. Um, so we've got the registration link out there and also the webinar materials. Now, they're currently working on those, so um, you don't want to go out there this afternoon and start looking at stuff because it's not updated yet. So <laughs> give us close to the end of next week to get that updated for you. Um, but we do have a separate, under the training, our SSP meetings and trainings page, we have a separate link for the redesign calendar year and materials for both USAS and payroll. And Amanda and Lori will be covering that next week with you guys in the webinar. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I am going to turn this over to Andrea. So I'm going to X out of my presentation here. And just give me a couple minutes to uh, pass the mic to Andrea and then she'll get started with payroll. You're coming in here? Okay, gotcha. Okay, we'll be ready here in a couple minutes.
Hey everyone, we'll start up here in about ten or in about uh, four minutes. We'll start back up at ten. We'll give you guys a little break here while we're getting ready. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and let me know. I'll mute yourself and you can go ahead and ask a question. Um, what we're going to be going over today is the um, calendar year end for payroll. Okay. Um, and again, if you have questions, you can also use the chat. All right, we do have some uh, updates for, um, one is for Pennsylvania, which is for this year tax, and one would be for um, the new uh, W-4 that is coming up for 2020. So we will be going over that at the end. So everything that we're gonna be going over here in the beginning is just kind of a review. All right, so. Um, the first thing is just a reminder that make sure um, you have all the districts, um, the Protect the American Act, that is January 31st. Everything has to be submitted um, in their copies for W-2, W-3 to the Social Security Administration by January 31st. Um, again, um, every district probably should go ahead and do a W-2 maintenance um, to check Social Security numbers for maybe their new employees for the year. So what they want to do is uh, go ahead and type in W-2 mate at the menu prompt and then they want to click number one. 
and, and that is your SSA employee verification generation. So this will create um, a generation of all their social security numbers. Um, here you can go ahead, they can um, select employees by termination date. Um, they can do it by hire date or they can do last pay date. So if they um, all new hire employees for this, this past year for 2019, they can just enter um, that in. Um, or they can just leave it blank and then pull in um, all employees. And then a file will be created, which is called an EBS REQ2K. And then this file will need to be uploaded to the SSA for Social Security verification. So then once um, um, the SSA goes through that file, it will return them and with any errors. Um, but when they get that file back, it's not in the name that we need it to have in order for our, um, our system, our software to know what it is. So they will need to take that file that they get from SSA and rename it to that EVSVER2K.SEQ from the one that I had just said on the screen before. And then what they want to do is take that file that they renamed and FTP it to their user's directory. And then they will want to run W2 maintenance again, but select number two. And then this is the employee verification return report. So it will take that file that you got from SSA and it will um, give them a report of what the listing of those errors are. And then they can go ahead and get those corrected. So if they want to rerun it one more time once they do those corrections and so make sure there is no error that comes back, then they can do that again. So they can run that as many times as they want. Uh, another thing for uh, pre-W2 PROC, um, you want to make sure your districts um, look in the OSDI abbreviation and dead name record. You want to make sure that the abbreviation is correct with what the OSDI code number and district and the district name. We want to make sure if a new, maybe a new um, school district came on, um, make sure that that is correct for those districts. Um, most of your districts probably already have this updated from the prior years, but just make sure that they have that correct. Um, the entity code and dead name for your city taxes. Um, this has to make sure that that code is completed for all their cities if it's magnetic reporting. And here is, you want to make sure the tax entity code on the bottom left, make sure that is um, entered for, for any district that uses city reporting magnetic tape. So just have them verify that's correct. Um, on to the CCA reader reporting. Again, they want to make sure in dead name for these cities that are reporting to, the, to these um, reporting CCA and RITA. Um, make sure those codes um, are entered because they won't get picked up in the submission file for CCA or RITA. So very important that those codes are correct and included. Um, we, I have included the Read and CCA um, websites, um, the URLs, so you can go ahead and look. And then here, this is where they will want to make sure that these codes are entered. You want to make sure the RITA and then the name. And again, it will be the same thing for CCA. Okay. And I did include the CCA um, tax percentages of what um, for the cities that are included for CCA, but um, I would probably, before you have your meeting with your own district, to go on to those sites and just verify that they did not add or delete any CCA RITA code or um, cities. So that way, because I just did that last week and that's, I just want to make sure you have the updated ones if they do decide to update anything between these couple of weeks before you go to your district. So I would just advise, go to those sites and just verify that nothing changed from what I have on listed in the wiki. Um, the next thing you want to do for the city um, and dead screen, um, they want to know if the employer, an employee, excuse me, is a resident of that city or are they an employee in that city? 
So employed, you want to make sure you put a C, and the residents, you want to put an R. So that's another thing that the REED NCCA will like to know. So make sure that is complete. For the health savings account, um, you want to make sure in dead name, if a district has started doing this, then make sure they have it set up as an I. Um, even, even if there's no employee amounts withheld, you still want to make sure that's an I because that tells it where, it's, where it has to go on the W-2. Um, here's a screenshot. This is what they will make sure that they want to have when they're in dead name. Select Section 125, Health Savings Account, letter I. The expo uh, employee expense reimbursement. Um, if the district desires amounts paid through warrant and they want this to appear as W-2 on the W-2 form as wages, um, then they're going to want to look at the reimbursement of the employee expense options. And we do have that included in the wiki. Um, again, then special processing may be needed in any manual changes. So if they just follow that um, expense document that we have, they shouldn't have any issues. Excludable moving expenses. Again, this is only for active military only. Um, reimbursements, and this is including payments made directly to third party for any active um, and military employees only. And then they would enter that amount in the move expense on the, that employee's federal record. Um, and again, if your districts have questions, again, they can contact maybe their legal advisor for their district. They have questions on that. The fringe benefit. The fringe benefit amount. Um, the contact legal advisor, um, again, that would be on the employee's 001 record. So you want to enter a tax amount in the fringe benefit field on the federal tax record. And then any tuition above the 5250, this is considered fringe benefit and would be subject to regular taxation. So then this is a figure that they would enter. So anything above the 5250. For the life insurance purchase, um, this would be the NC1. Um, again, um, you would enter this NC1 pay type in future or current before the last pay of the, for the year for that employee. Um, if you do use the NC1, do not enter that amount in the life insurance field all on one deduction record. Um, when that check update is ran, then the NC1 gets picked up, and then this is treated differently for, your, for the taxation for the employee. Um, the tax amount for Medicare and Social Security um, will be calculated. And then no federal, Ohio, or OSDI tax amounts will be calculated on this amount. Okay. okay. Um, if the district didn't get that NC1 life insurance in um, before that last pay, then they're going to have to file this set of uh, documentation for this um, instruction. So then they would have to increase the quarter and year-to-date gross and the taxable gross figures on the federal, the state, and then the city. And also they're going to want to increase the year-to-date year -to -date taxable on the FICA and Medicare records. And then they were going to have to obtain the payment from the employee for the FICA, which is 62.0% of the taxable premium, and then the 1.45% for the Medicare, so either one. And then they want to include this amount on the year-to-date deduct total field in their Medicare deduction record for that employee. Then the board will have to do the same thing and calculate this using the same steps. So you need to get it for the employee and the board. And then you're going to want to enter the taxable premium of the life insurance on the federal tax deduction record 
and dead screen on the, under the life insurance cost line. And then for your quarter report to balance, then you're going to also want to go to that, their job screen, screen three, and then on, there's a line for life insurance, and then on the quarter, year-to-date, and FICA amounts, you want to add that um, non-cash earnings there. And then that will make your quarter report balance and you won't be off. So here's a screenshot. You just want to make sure that life insurance cost is entered here. And again, this is only if you do not use the NC1 pay type in up to kill or future before the last pay. Dependent care, if not using the DPE care deduction type, uh, mainly enter dependent care amounts in the federal tax field for dependent care. So your max is only going to be 5,000 or 2,500 for married filing separate. And then this is on the employee's um, federal record in dependent care. This is where you would put that amount. And this is if they did not use the DP care deduction type throughout their payroll. Company vehicles. If, you're, if your district has, uh, they allow you to use company vehicles, um, then they will have to calculate what the lease value will be, and then they would enter that amount on the employee's federal record under vehicle lease. Employer sponsored health care costs. Um, this is uh, due to the Affordable Care Act um, requires the employers to report the cost of coverage um, for the employer sponsored group health plan. Um, this would be then um, entered um, on their W-2. And this is just for informational purposes. It's not used for anything else. The government just wants to know how much is getting paid total for employee to employer. Um, again, if an employee is paying for the insurance out of pocket, um, you want to make sure that this amount gets added to the employer health field on the employee's 001 federal record. So that way that amount gets included um, both for the employee and employer contributions. Um, if the employee paid maybe half a year out of pocket and then the other half was started through payroll, um, go ahead and just enter those two amounts together and then enter that on the employer health field record on that employee's 001 record. If the district only tracks the employee portion of health care costs in the payroll system, um, then the district will need to create a spreadsheet um, with the employee's year-to-date cost for the health insurance and then also what the board cost was for that employee health insurance. And then what they're going to want to do is total those two amounts and then they can use the USP load, and then these figures can be loaded right into the employer health field um, on that 001 federal deduction record. So any of those options are available. Um, they must report the cost employer sponsored health care um, in the box office code DD um, if the district files 250 or more W-2s for, that, for this calendar year. And just a reminder, um, they don't have to include the life, dental, and vision. Um, this is a, if it's a separate plan. Now, if it's included as part of the medical um, plan, then they can, um, so they don't have to break that out. Um, so usually a lot of them have them all separated. So it's just the health is what they're wanting. The contribution amount by the employee and employer for health savings, um, make sure this is not included, because um, this gets reported in box 12 is code W. So that is not included in that health, employer-sponsored health coverage for HSA. Um, the flag on the dead name record, um, there is a flag here, it's called included employer-sponsored health coverage. And this would be even if maybe you have your regular is your employer portion and your annuity is for your employee portion, and you just want to make sure that both of those, that flag is set on both of the deductions. So that way it gets included when that W-2 is run, W-2 uh, proc is ran. Um, again, if you answer yes, and then those year-to-date deduction totals um, will be included and moved, like I said, to the employee's W-2. Um, here is a screenshot of what I was uh, um, saying um, in dead name. 
for this is the annuity part of it, um, include as employer sponsored health coverage. This is where they would need to make sure this is yes. And again, they would want to do that on the employer's side um, if they use a regular deduction for that. Um, again, for the employer health, there is a field on the 001 federal deduction record. Um, and this will allow for that amount that they put in there in that box to go in box 12 code DD. Um, and a reminder, this will overwrite anything um, that the, you have for the payroll year. So whatever you put in that employer health field box is going to override and not total anything for that employee that they may have had come, coming out on both sides throughout the year. So just a reminder that that will override that. So here is a screenshot of that OO1 record and the employer health. So they can put this in here if the employer, um, employee and the employer needed to add the amount together and they needed to put that in there, this is where they would do that. So when W-2 proc is processed, that will total the employee and the board contribution amounts from the deductions flagged, like I stated in dead name, only include employer um, amounts. And then if there is a value in the employer health field on the federal deduction screen, this is what will be used instead. And then that total, again, will be copied to the box 12. And then the submission file gets created with a W-2 proc. Um, if the district only tracks the employee portion and payroll and not the board side, um, they can go ahead and create a spreadsheet, like I said early, and add containing those employee, employer, add those together. And then using USP load, use the deduction screen um, type and then load those in. And then those amounts will get loaded again into the deduction screen and federal. Um, the employer underscore health underscore COB coverage is what you're going to want to use in your load file. Um, just a note, um, if you aren't currently processing the board portion for the medical insurance, it still can be tracked in your track um, in the employer sponsored health care for that portion. Um, they would just have to make sure they have a deduction set up um, for that employer portion. And then um, in board desk or on the dead name record, just make sure they don't have that employer portion that those object codes um, don't have anything in them. Leave those blank. And then those won't get included in the board desk. All right. Um, the IRS has added a new code, which is FF for box 12. I think this was a year or two ago. Um, it will report a total amount of permitted benefits under the qualified for small employer health reimbursement arrangement. Um, this will be eligible, um, will allow eligible employers to pay or reimburse medical care expenses of eligible employees after employees provide proof of coverage. So this code to report the total amount permitted benefits under that employer health reimbursement. Um, the max reimbursement is for 2019 is now 5,150, and then for family it's 10,450. So that did change, so I just want to make note of that. Eligible employers, um, this would be small employers with less than 50 full-time um, employees, and those who work 130 hours a month, or 30 or more hours a week for 120 consecutive days. So just make note of that. Another eligibility is that the employer does not offer group health plans to their employees. So this would be for any districts that does not offer group health plan to their employees, which I, I believe most districts do, so this probably won't come into play. But just in case. If users enter a value in the dead stream under the health reimbursement on the federal record, and then this is the value that will appear on the W-2 tape file. And it would be coded as FF in box 12. And then this will also appear on the W-2 city date.dat file. 
And then on the W-2 report, if you want to double check if you do have some employees or a district that has this, um, it will be listed under the federal, and it will be called health reimbursed. And then also that amount will also show at the bottom at the total as the grand totals and report total. So you can double check there too. And then this is a screenshot of the employee's 001 record and then the health reimbursement. Um, you want to run W-2 proxy for the last day of 2019 has been completed. Um, you can go ahead and start balancing. And then you always want to make sure you start reviewing, correcting warnings and errors. So maybe you always start this after every pay is completed. And that way when you're ready to start running W-2 reports, you have a clean um, error report. Um, programs used to generate um, balancing reports. It's created W-2 print forms, W-2 proc does, and it creates W-2.dat files for any laser printing. to create the W2City.dat file, and then this is used for your special city submissions. And then you also have a W2Tape submission file that's created, and it's called the W2Tape.seq, and then this is for your federal, states, and cities. When you're running W2 Proc, um, the user running it will need to put in the name and the address and then any identification numbers for the district. So that would be their federal, it will ask for Ohio. And then just verify, have them go over that W-2 report and make sure everything looks good. Um, when the user is running W-2 proc, they can decide on what sorting option they want. Um, again, any sort option is, is acceptable for electronic filing. But if they are still doing paper filing, then they must sort by name. So here's your sort option. And again, up to the district how they run, want to run that if they're submitting by electronic filing. Um, you also have the third party sick pay disability payment. Um, this will be usually sent to the district within a, in a good amount of time, uh, probably in the beginning of December, hopefully, or maybe end of November when they start receiving these forms. Um, this amount would have to be entered the total. This would be um, included in the notification, um, the total amount withheld and paid for the district for a third-party payer. Um, your district will need to um, show what type of employer they are. So when they're running that, it's going to ask them for the kind of employer. So by now, a district probably should know what they are, um, state or local, um, probably a non-501C, or maybe their Y, state and local tax exempt employer 501C. So it just depends if they applied for the 501C status, if it was granted, then they would be the 501C, yes. Why? Um, and then you also, the district will have to enter in their name and address, and the identification number. Um, the contact name information will be used on the W-2, and it is it, this is a required field. So whoever's running W-2 PROC will have to enter in their name. Um, any additional deduction codes, um, this allows districts, um, you can add in box 14 as other. Um, up to six can be entered. Um, some examples may be the least vehicle value. Um, other user values um, can come secondary. And if the employee has all six of those that you entered, only the first three for each employee um, in order will be um, listed. So only three will be listed for employee. Um, alignment forms. Um, you could also um, ask if you want a dummy um, W-2 for alignment. You can say yes or no to this.
Um, here's a screenshot of that additional deduction where they can enter different deductions um, that they want. Um, up to six, they'll ask you for six deduction codes, but again, only three, if the encounters for that employee, will be listed on their W-2. Um, the W-2 report, um, this should balance to your 941 totals as they were reported throughout the quarters. Um, earnings register, earnings sum figures. Um, again, this will represent your amounts as withheld from the employees. And then you also have your quarter report figures, and this is um, amounts as current of year-to-date figures. So you want to make sure you balance your federal, your Ohio and city taxes, and the gross amount using your W-2 report. And here's an example of your 941. You'll have your first, second, third, and fourth quarter, and then the year-to-date and the W-2 report total. These two totals should equal um, except for any special payments that you might have had. And then at the totals at the bottom of the, of the W-2 report, um, amounts in this column under the dead name, this should be used for balancing. So on the earnings register column and then on, on W-2 report, these two figures should be made uh, used for those, those should match. And then at, another option is the amount in the year-to-date total field column there. This, these amounts on the column on your quarter report should be used for balancing. And then the amount on the report totals column on your W-2 report text, um, use these figures for balancing. So you have some for your quarter report, and then you have your W-2 report. So maybe some items that are affecting your balancing between W-2 proc and quarter report. And again, we included that in the wiki. Um, for documentation, any um, specific effects. So go ahead and take a look at that. Um, some might be your dependent care benefits over a limit. Uh, maybe fringe benefits you entered. Uh, Medicare pickup amount. Your taxable third-party sick pay. Your company vehicle payment. And then if you had employee expense reimbursement paid through warrant. So these are some items that are going to affect this balancing between your W-2 proc and your quarter reports. So just a reminder of that. Um, again, your dependent care benefits. Um, this is any amount over 5,000 is added to the total and taxable gross amounts on your federal, Ohio, and city total and taxable gross fields on the W-2 report. <laughs> so example, if the employee had a 6,000, um, added to the dependent care, the system knows to only pick up a thousand. So they want to make sure they enter the total amount of the dependent care, just not the thousand dollars. It needs to it, it needs to see the five thousand and above, and then it will take what is um, the difference and have that amount show. And again, this will cause a gross amounts on your W report to be higher. So make note of that. So here's the dependent care, and again, you want to add up the total amount of the employee's dependent care, not the difference. Your fringe benefits. You want to add all fringe benefits to the total and taxable gross amount on their federal and Ohio records. And then this will cause, again, your gross amounts on your W-2 report to be a little higher. And here's an example on the, that employee's 001 record, the fringe benefit field. Medicare pickup. Um, the amount added to the total and taxable gross amounts on the federal, Ohio, and OSDI records um, will cause gross amounts, again, to, to be higher on the W-2 report for that district. 
Um, if the tax board amounts option is not used on the city tax record in dead names, which is that flag, it's that to no on dead names, then the system will tax the Medicare FICA pickup field should be set to yes if the city taxes the Medicare pickup. Um, if the Medicare pickup is added to the city total and the taxable gross amounts on the W-2 report, um, then the employee pays the tax after the fact. And then here is a screenshot of the city record for an employee. Um, you want to make sure that tax Medicare FICO pickup is set to yes. If the tax board amount is used on the city tax record and that flag is set to yes, then the tax is withheld during the payroll. Um, the tax Medicare FICO pickup flag field is not used and it's replaced by the tax board amount field if this is populated, field is populated with the board pickup deduction. So just a reminder, um, they would want to have the tax board amount set as yes, and then they want to make sure they enter in um, what deductions are taxed for board, for board pickup. Okay. Um, if they had taxable third-party sick pay, um, they would need to add the sick pay amount to the total and taxable growth fields on the federal and high on the uh, OSCI records. And again, what this will do will cause uh, the gross amount on the W-2 report for that district to be higher. And again, we included the third-party sick pay instructions and, and then also we included a notification um, example of, how, of what this would do. So here's an example of a third-party sick pay, um, if it's non-taxable or if it's taxable. And we did highlight um, the Medicare record. Just make sure that they increase the total, total Medicare tax by the amount the company withheld from the benefit. And I believe that what they're stating is here to the far right, the Medicare withheld. If they withhold uh, Medicare, this is what they're going to have to make sure that they adjust on here. Okay. That we just included that for you, but that again is in the wiki that you can copy that or um, print that off. If it's non taxable third party sick pay, um, then this doesn't affect any balancing, um, it doesn't affect any taxes for the employee, and all they would need to do is enter that on the employee's federal record, um, and then this amount will print in their box 12 as a code J. And then here's the screenshot, the third party sick pay, this is where a non-taxable would be entered. Use of company vehicle field. Um, again, you want to add the vehicle lease amount from the OON federal record um, to the total and taxable gross fields on their federal Ohio total and taxable gross fields on the W-2 report. And again, um, using the company vehicle field, uh, this will increase uh, the gross amount on the W-2 report. Here's a screenshot of your vehicle lease field on the employee's 001 record, so this is where this amount would go. Employee expense reimbursement. If a district wants to, um, wants employee reimbursement, um, originally paid maybe through the warrant side to appear on the employee's W-2 as wages and manual changes are made. Um, this will create a balancing difference, again, between the district's quarter report and W-2 PROC. So just a reminder. It's going to make cause the W-2 report PROC to show higher gross amounts than that was actually paid through payroll. And again, um, expense reimbursed. Um, we have that document in the wiki for you. Maybe some balancing problems. Uh, maybe any voided checks from a prior calendar year that was done. You want to check your check status report for this. Maybe any refund of annuity that was withheld and in the prior calendar year. Um, if, if this has happened, um, auto report is a good friend to run and you can verify anything that was year to date changed. Uh, maybe any manual updates, again, auto report, 
And then, like I said, search for year to date changes. So what you want to do when you're viewing the report, just select F, and then what you want to do is just enter in the YTD, and then you just click Next, and then every time they, it sees in y, uh, YTD for year to date, it will pop up and be highlighted, and you can view if those changes were supposed to be made or not. So it's a very good tool to use. So here's an example of a W-2 proc report. Um, you have your special amounts from W-2. You have your descriptions for the W-2 boxes, and these come from dead name. Tax withheld, this will come from your dead screen from the employees. And your taxable growth and your total growth. So those three come from dead screen. And the annuities, this is the calculated growth minus taxable growth. Maybe some common W-2 PROC messages. Um, one probably will get a lot is calculated annuity amount exceeds the total annuity. So all this indicates is that the total growth minus the taxable growth is greater than what the total annuities from the year to date deduction amounts were. And again, this indicates possible problem with maybe annuity amount, maybe the gross or the taxable growth. So again, verify any manual updates or error adjustments that were made, and again, audit report probably would be um, helpful here. Uh, maybe the invalid uh, Social Security number. Again, if you did the W-2 maintenance in the beginning, hopefully then you wouldn't run into this. Um, so you want to make sure you verify the employee's Social Security number matches with what is showing in the bio screen. And then you can use mass change, change social security number to update if that's the case. But again, if you did the mass W-2 mate in the beginning, um, it should catch any differences. Um, the Medicare amount does not equal 1.45% uh, of the Medicare gross. Um, here, this might be incorrect, a Medicare tax. So again, you're going to want to verify this, these amounts. Because SSA and IRS, they probably will not accept them if these are incorrect. And also that goes for any Medicare taxable growth. So verify that those, um, the Medicare tax and the Medicare tax growth is correct. It probably will stop the files from being submitted. Um, again, just verify if any manual updates have been done. Check the Medicare pickup records for your employees that have this, um, either the 692, 694, or if they have the 693 and 695. Um, if they have the 694, 695 record, um, that triggers the system to calculate the Medicare tax um, on the Medicare paid um, by the district on the employee's tax. Maybe they'll get a negative annuity on file for this employee. Um, again, this usually means maybe that uh, they had a refund for a prior year's annuity amount for an employee. Um, if desired to report it as withheld and refunded in this current calendar year, then what they need to do is go into dead screen for that employee for that deduction and zero that annuity amount out. And then they're going to use the deduction screen and what they're going to do is increase the total gross amounts on that employee's federal the Ohio School District and the city, only if the city honored that annuity initially. And again, they can find that out if they did um, on the dead name records for that city. So section 25. So increase the year-to-date growth amounts then on job, job screen three to balance. So this will balance your quarter report. If you didn't do that last step, then your quarter report is probably going to show a difference. Just a reminder, make sure you do that um, adjustment on their employee's job screen. Retire plan box flag on federal record is overriding the W-2 PROC calculation. So if the federal have, uh, has a flag marked no, but finds an active retirement record, uh, maybe if the federal has a flag, um, has flag marked as yes, and then it doesn't find an active retirement record. 
So it is very common for districts to receive this informational for students who do not participate in the search. So then in this case, they have no action as needed for these type of employees. So um, another error could be the OSDI gross or tax. Um, indicate taxable OSDI wages, uh, but no tax was withheld. Again, um, a lot of districts might get this. It's com uh, common informational for employees who have a, like a very small wage amount per payroll. So you might see those. Um, you just want to verify, make sure the amounts are correct. And usually you don't have to do any corrections for this if it's just an informational for OSDI. Um, this might be another big one that uh, districts probably will get is the total annuities um, do not equal total growth plus taxable growth. Um, so what this is, is a calculate annuity amount, which is your total gross plus taxable, does not match your year-to-date annuity amount from dead screen. So, so you have to verify your dead screen. Um, what the program does is compares the total annuity from the deductions to the total gross plus taxable gross calculation, which uses the federal tax record of that employee. So what this is saying, possible problem, maybe with their annuity total, um, total gross and taxable gross. So again, audit report. Um, to continue on that error, um, again, you want to verify maybe if any manual updates were made throughout the year. Verify if any refund of deductions were done. And again, if a refund from a prior calendar year, and if that district wants it to appear as the amounts are withheld and refunded in this calendar year, what they will need to do is increase that total growth on that federal, Ohio, and OSDI and city if they initially honor that annuity for that year to date. Um, the fatals that can come across, um, this employee's Medicare wages are less than their Social Security wages. So uh, the Medicare gross wages amount is incorrect, and maybe the FICA, which is their Social Security, Gross wages amount is incorrect. Um, update the gross amounts on dead screens that have the incorrect amount. And then this error should be correct before creating a tape file. So this would stop the tape file from being created. Um, and then if they do need help, the Social Security Administration will, um, will contact the district if the error is not fixed. So I guess it probably will send it through, but then they will get a call. So if they do get this fatal, make sure that's corrected and then we run W2 proxy and make sure that falls off. So if uh, we have a list or documentation for more explanations, we have a W2 proc errors. Um, it's on the W2 proc and W2 proc error list. So I do have that included if they need more um, explanation. The W2 instructions. Um, specific details on the W-2 form reporting requirements. Um, again, they can go ahead and find this at the IRS that we um, put on there, irs.gov. So let me just highlight that and put that in their URL. Web. Um, W-2 instructions for corrections. Um, again, we included um, what page they're found on and then what the, um, what the correction. So maybe corrections for W-2 and W-3. Um, uses a W-2C form. A W-3C form must accompany that W-2C form. And the W-3C form corrects the total submitted on the tape file by ITC. So if they already created that W-3 form, um, then yes, a W-3C needs to be accompanied by it if they already submitted the tape file. Um, maybe there's an incorrect address for an employee. Um, a, a correction form is not required for this. Maybe a, de a deceased employee wages. Um, we also have that listed in our wiki, wiki for instructions on that. Um, if the payment is made in the year employee died, um, then your W-2 reporting and 1099 is required. But if it payment is made in the year after the death of the employee, then only a 1099 reporting is required. Designated Roth IRA amounts, um, that can be found on page nine. Um, 
Um, if you have questions on educational assistance, um, that is found also on page nine. And then also they can um, also contact their legal advisor if they have questions on that. Um, it's employee business expense reimbursement. Um, that is also on page nine. And also they can contact their legal advisor if they have any questions on that. The employee taxes paid by the employer, that is found on page nine also. And that would be the Medicare pickup. Fringe benefits is on page 10. Group life insurance is on page 10, and that's anything NC1 over 50,000. The health savings account you can find on page 11. And the lost W-2 form, page 11 also. Um, hand type a new form, and then all they need to do is put reissued statement on new copy. Maybe moving expenses if they have questions, that's page 11. This applies to only to members of the armed forces, again. Um, third party sick pay, page 13. You wanna verify taxability using the information received from the annuity company. So uh, your district should be receiving those forms shortly. Um, box A, that's page 15. This is the, your employee's Social Security number, and this is what they will come from BioScreen. Box B is their federal EIN number. Box C will show the employer information is entered in W-2 PROC. Boxes E and F, that can be found on page 15, and this is the employee's name and address, and this information comes from BioScreen also. We'll look at the legal name, which is found on the second page of BioScreen first, if there's a legal name in there, because maybe people have a legal name, but they don't like to be called that legal name. They have a different name that they use to be called, and that's what shows on their actual BioScreen. Um, but the W-2 needs to have what their legal name is, so that's where you would put that on that second screen in BioScreen. Box one, wages from federal tax taxable gross amount. Your box two, this is the tax withheld from your to date field from the employee's federal tax record. In box three, it will show the social security wages records that were flagged with a category of F. And then box four is your social security taxes um, withheld. Your box five is your Medicare wages with the deduction category of M. You have your Medicare taxes and withheld um, for box six. And your box 10 is your dependent care benefit. Uh, we did have a question, is it possible to print full middle name on W-2s? Um, I think right now it's just the middle initial, but I don't know if it's the legal on that screen too. I will have to look at that um, I can't remember if it has an option for uh, more than just one initial. So I will have to ask for that, Andrew. Um, dependent care benefits is found on the federal tax record or the dependent care annuity record. This is box 10. For your box 12 code, um, you have um, page 18. So this is your code C, which is group term life NC1 over 50,000. You have your code D, which is your 401k amounts, and you have your code E, which is your 403b. Uh, more codes for box 12 is your code F, which is your 408k, your code G, which is your 457b, and F. Your code H will hold the 501c, 18, and D, and the code J was your non-taxable sick pay. Code P, it, this is your excludable moving expenses. Your code T is your adoption benefits. Your code W is the employer contribution to self health savings account. Your code AA is designated raw contributions under the section 401k. Code BB is your designated raw contributions under 403b. Code DD, this is your cost your employer sponsored health coverage. And your code EE is your designated Roth contributions under a governmental section 457B plan. And code FS 
um, permitted benefits under qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangements. Uh, and again, the max reimbursement did change this year for single and family. For your box 13, this is your retirement plan we'll list. So here we would have your 401A and K, your 403B, 408K, and the 501C18. Box 14, um, this would be the vehicle lease from the federal tax record. Um, other deductions under in W-2 proc may be option possibility. This is where you can um, add up to six, but only three will show for uh, each employee if they have those. Uh, union dues, retirement, really there's any, uh, whatever the district wants to enter there. The W-3 form, um, this is not required unless filing on paper. So this is the totals on the W-2 submission file created by W-2 proc, and then this is the substitute for the W-3 form. Um, the corrections before files have been submitted to SSA. If the submission has not occurred, and then the ICC, you, can restore the copy files, and then you can allow the district to rerun W-2 PROC. So they can fix it if they did not submit it yet. But if the district already submitted the files, uh, or the ICC already submitted the files, um, then this scenario, um, and this scenario A, W2C and then the W3C will have to be submitted together. Um, the district can run a W2C to make process of creating text file output forms easier. Um, the W2C, uh, it does not create a correcting submission file for the reporting entity. So just a reminder, um, there is a W2C program that they can go ahead and, and do a text file but there's no submission, so just, just to let them know. Okay, so preparing for your 2020 new year. Um, you wanna start entering tax changes with holding rates effective January 1st. This would have to make sure after their first, uh, before the first payment of the new year is done. Um, I included the URL for the city rates and OSCI rates. So they probably want to double check that before they run their first pay and make sure nothing got updated between now and the first of the year. Um, CCA city rates, here's the URL for that and Rita. And again, like I said, I did include that in the wiki in the on our underneath our calendar year meeting. Um, but like I said, I would prefer maybe make sure before you have your meeting to double check to make sure nothing got added or deleted off of those. Maybe uh, your a district is unsure if employees should be taxed. Um, here is an address that um, they can copy and put in, uh, in their web search and they can look up maybe the tax rate, um, address, zip code, and latitude and longitude. So they can look up the tax rate by those three options. Um, they also can use the change deduction for updates to deduction screens. So just remind your district that this program can change deduction or board amount or the stop and start date on specific deduction records. And it's really easy to use. Um, they just go ahead and click on what they want to change, maybe the employee um, deduction code, and then what they would do is enter what deduction code it was and then what the, um, the rate was and what it want, used to be. But I think if you had district or employees that have different um, amounts, like a city probably would be fine because everybody probably has the same city. If, I mean, if they're in that city, it would have the same 1.5%, um, then they can change it to 1.25 for everybody. Um, but if they have maybe a couple employees that have different amounts, uh, they would have to do this for every employee that has a different rate. So. Okay, so now we're coming up to our updates for 2019. And this is only gonna be for ICCs that have any Pennsylvania employees. So this is not gonna to pertain to everybody. So it's just a little, I have a couple of screenshots and then we're gonna get on to the next part, which is the new W-4. So um, the district ICCs that do have um, Pennsylvania employees um, just wanna pay attention to this part. Um, all right, so 
So Pennsylvania tax. Um, the state of Pennsylvania requires a W-2 output file if a district has 10 or more W-2s for PA. Now, if you have one, you can still use this file to submit. It does, you don't have to just if you have 10 or more. Um, it just is required if you have 10 or more. But if you want to do it for one or two employees, you can do that also. Um, if the district, if your district already has a dead name, has a set up for Pennsylvania for other states, and the state and the address of your field has PA, so they want to make sure that the state is PA, then the PA file will be created. So the Pennsylvania file will be created, and it also has to have a state ID must be correct for the Pennsylvania and dead name records. So make sure they have that entered too. Um, if they don't, then they will have to register with Pennsylvania um, using the PA 100 form. Um, when running W-2 procs, so if it encounters a Pennsylvania employee, it will create an output file called w2pa.seq. If your district doesn't have any uh, Pennsylvania employees, then they will not see this file being created at all. So it's only if they have Pennsylvania employees. Okay, so here is a screenshot of the dead name record. So they want to make sure that they have the type of state, they have the PA entered in the address, and also the state ID needs to be entered. Make sure those three are uh, filled in to be included on the file. So if a district has Pennsylvania employees, um, you want to go ahead and process the output file that was created when they ran W-2 PROC. And again, that is called the W-2PA SEQ file. So then this is the process to create a W-2 MASK underscore PA, which is similar to the IRS master file that you, you create every year. So when you run your W-2 tape, there is a new option that you're going to see. And everybody will see this, even if you don't have Pennsylvania employees. Um, it will process, you will want to include P. So you're going to have to do a master file. You have to do P. And then if, if your district does your read MCCA, it's exactly the same. It's just now you have to run a master tape for Pennsylvania. So. And then what this will do when you run P, it will create an RA record that will be in the W2 MASS PA SEQ file. So when you're looking at that file, you just want to make sure there's an RA record. So the next thing that the district that you will want to do with HC is append that W2 PA SEQ file into the W2 MASS file. So they have to pin these together. So type the command, append w2pa.seq, w2mass underscore pa.seq. So again, this is similar to when you're doing your w2mass for your regular file for federal. You just have to make sure you file these steps. And then what this will do, will put an RA record in front of the RE record and then keep it all into the w2mass pa.seq file. So again, you can look at that file and make sure that they have an RA and an RE record in that file. And then you want to run W2 tape for the PA master file, and you want to go ahead and choose finish option. And then this will create the RF record, which is at the end of the SEQ file. So you're going to see your RA, you're going to see an RE, and you're going to see an RF record for Pennsylvania. And then you're going to want to transfer that file. If you're using Reflections STP, you just want to make sure you uncheck that delete trailing spaces under setup and then translate translation tab. Just make sure that's not checked. And then you can put that to a designated error in your computer. And then here your file is ready to be uploaded. And then when you're running W2 tape, it also will create a W2PA underscore tape dot S text file, which it does. Um, if you were running that for federal or for any city. So here's an example of that W2PA tape that check. What they're going to have to do, Pennsylvania doesn't want this text form to be sent to them. They want it in a CSV format, and Classic does not do that. Redesign will be able to, Classic does not. So for this year, if your district's still on Classic, 
then they will have you will have to create a CSV file, and then this is what is submitted to Pennsylvania. Um, you will use that W-2 text form, which we show here, to get the information that you need. And then you will have to um, use this URL that we included, and then this shows the file specs, which are located on 14, page 14. And then just follow that, create it as a CSV um, spreadsheet, and then that's what you send to them. And if you do have questions on that, you will probably have to get a hold of Pennsylvania um, if you have any more questions on that. But that general tax information, that should have everything. If you have contact information, that should all be in there. But the specs that you're, you're going to need to use to create that CSV file is going to be on page 14. Does any Pennsylvania employer or ITCs have questions? Okay. If you do later, let us know or create a ticket and send it to us. Okay. Now the next thing is the federal tax calculation is changing for January 1st, 2020. Don't know if you had heard about this, but the W-4 is changing. So there's a little bit, I got quite a few slides on this one. So I wanted to be very detailed on it. To explain to this. Okay, so the IRS is releasing an updated version of the W-4. So if your district employees already have a W-4 and um, they don't have to do um, fill out a new W-4. So any old employees, they don't have to if they don't want to. They don't have to fill it out. But any new employees coming into the district as of January 1st have to fill out this new W-4 form. Um, Okay, um, so then what help pay um, will now use this new tax table starting as of January 1st. And then new fields have been added to the um, employees 001 federal record. So it's gonna look a little different now. So this is what a, their new federal record will look like once this is updated um, before you run your first pay. So you won't see this update probably until after, right before the first year or right after. So, um, so here you have the three new fields that have been added are your filing status. Use, use the new W-4 and two like jobs. And I'm gonna go through in detail of each of those fields, okay? So normal status of filing. So when this new uh, new screen gets updated, um, every employee is going to show use new W-4 as no. So this it will not switch over to yes. You guys, the district manually has to go in and switch that to yes if their um, employee filled out a new form and they have to go in and say yes to that. Okay, so that everybody will be set to no. So employees that are not using the W-4, um, the marital status and the number of ex exemptions will be used to calculate the employer federal withholding amount. And then also they must have the use new W-4 as no. So if they're sticking to their old one and are not using it, because these are for prior employees of January 1st, not new, because everybody and new employees have to use this new W-4 and it goes off their old exemption and their marital status and they use new, w, use new W-4 and that has to be no, okay? Using the new W-4. So employees that are using the new W-4 that are coming in as a January 4 first employees and, or if an old employee wants this, then they would have to go into their uh, employees use new W-4 and say yes. Did this employee fill out the new W-4 as of January 1st? Yes or no. This is where they would put that. The filing status is required only if the employee has the new W-4 as of January 1st. So down here I even included a screenshot to show it's single or married, married filing jointly or widower or the head of household. They will mark one of those. 
And then in the 01, this is where they would put that filing status. Required is using a new W form only. This is the federal filing status. And then this matches what we had up here, the single, married, and household. Is it one, single and married, two, married joint or qualified widow, or three, head of household? So all they would have to do is just follow what they checked there and follow that and enter that in. The next field is the dependent field. Um, again, this is only used if they filled out that new W form as of January 1st. And this is the annual dependent amount when claiming dependent. So again, I took a snippet of the W-4, what it looks like, the new one coming up, and this is where they would get this amount. It comes from step three, claim dependent, and it's box three. So whatever amount they have entered in there, that's what they're gonna wanna put in that depend field, okay? The income field. Um, this is the annual other income amount when adding in any other income the employee wants to include. So once, they, once you get that form back, the income field, you look on step 4A, other income. Whatever they have in 4A is what's going to go in that income box on their 001 record. Okay? Now, um, deduct field. This should only contain any amount, which is from step 4, deduction from W-4, from their W-4. So this is going to come any annual deduction amount an employee wants to reduce their federal withholding amount. So this would be their 4B on step four of that W-4. So whatever amount they entered in there would need to go into that deduct field on that employee's deduction record. Two light job fields. Um, this field should be a yes or a no if the new W-4 is being used as of 2020. And this is whether, this is based whether W-4 step 2C has been checked. So I included a screenshot and it says if there are only two job totals, you may check the box. And then you do the same form W-4 for other jobs. So if this box is checked, then answer is yes. If it does not have a check mark, and then you're going to want to say no. So again, do like jobs only if they have only if they're using the new W-4. Then here, if the new W-4 is 120 and step 2C has check mark, then you're going to say yes. If it's not checked, then you say no here. The additional withholding field. Um, this is no changes, just wanted to highlight it. Um, this is for the older and the new, newer W-4. This hasn't changed, which is step 4C in the new W-4. Um, this should contain any amount if the employee wants any additional federal money withheld from their paycheck. So that stays the same for both. And then this is just a screenshot of what the W-4, the new one, will show for extra withholding. So they would find that on the step 4C. So updates were made to the IRS federal tax tables, and this will be as of January 1st. Um, these new tables will be used for all your, their payrolls, dates starting as of January 1st or later. Um, again, there are two different tax tables as of January 1st. They're gonna have their standard withholding rate table, and then this table is for W-2 form that is before January 1st, or if the W-4 is from January 1st of 2020 or later. And then if box two, step two, of the dirty four is not checked. So a little confusing probably, but that is how what table it's going to decide what to use for an employee. And then the other one is your non-standard withholding rate table. And this is W4 form um, 1 1 or later and the box in step two of the W4 is checked. Those scenarios have to be in effect in order for non-standard withholding racks tables to be picked up in calculating. Uh, 
Um, both tables have three types of filing status groups. So again, you have your married filing joint, single or married filing separate head of household. So your non and your standards still have the same three types of filing status. Um, if you use the tax maintenance tax screen, these tax tables will be updated. Um, I included this in there if you are familiar with how to look at those. Um, the ID is fed and the filing is the type for each filing status. So I included that in there if you are familiar with those uh, tax maintenance tax screen. And the W-2-4 draft for um, 2020, there's not one out there yet for actual employees or districts to use. It's still showing as draft, but that should be coming out shortly. So you probably just have to keep an, a, um, a watch out for it. Um, but right now it's still showing it has draft on all the pages. So they can't use that one yet. And I'm not sure exactly when that would be coming out. But I did include a link to show you if you wanted to go ahead and look at that draft. And I also included it in the wiki underneath our documentation or our um, instructions that you can go ahead and take a look at it. So that is in there with all our other. And then I also included the link for publication 15Q, Federal Income Tax Recoding Methods. And then if, they have, if you have any facts or questions on that, um, on the draft, I included that um, URL for you also. So that should be able to help um, answering some questions. Um, and another thing, one more thing to remind your district, um, when they run their first payroll in January, the, the employees to high taxes will be less. So that way, if you let them know now, they probably won't have that question for you later when they see that and do it when their employees are questioning why their taxes are less, which is good. So I would think that's a good thing. But I just wanted to put that in there, just a heads up. Okay, I think we're, we're good with all our changes and everything that's coming up for the new year. So again, if you have questions, um, please let us know. And you, know, you can enter a ticket or, and we can definitely try to help you out. Hey, Andrea, I did have one oh, question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, is tax tab gonna be updated then too? Yes, everything that has to do with the federal taxes will be updated. Okay, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. When do you anticipate the um, um, release coming out with the tax tables, uh, both federal and state? Um, I will ask Kim on that. She will send out a information on that. I'm not sure she'll do that right at the end of the month or she'll do that beginning of January. I will have to ask her on that one. But she will send a, a, a email out stating when that will be done. I know we have districts that usually have payrolls the first week of January, so just okay. anticipation on that. She, they will definitely make sure uh, you, you're stating that they will actually their first pay will be January first. Sometime that week. Okay, sometime that um, week. Okay, yes, probably. She, yes. Yes, she will make sure that that is all the Ohio, the new, the new Ohio, and the federal will all get updated before anybody runs their first pay. Is there any other questions? Okay, and I think this completes our calendar end for this year. I thank you for joining us. And yeah, and uh, like I said, next week we're gonna be going through um, the redesign steps um, for both UCS and payroll, same time, um, and we will be recording that session as well. Thanks everybody, have a good weekend. Thank you.